It is March 1st, 2022, and you are back with us here on Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden. And it is me, Danielle Hallen, and welcome back. Welcome back. And I was saying that you're here with us, but of course we're not physically together. I know. If you want to physically meet us, Danielle, can that happen? It absolutely can. You guys can come and meet us at CrimeCon in Las Vegas. It's April 29th through May 1st. All you have to do is use code Crime After Crime, and you can get 10% off of the standard pass. Now, I will say, don't wait. Passes do sometimes sell out like very quickly. All of a sudden, they'll be gone, and you don't want to miss the chance to meet many of your favorite true crimers in person, obviously including us. And we may or may not have some really cool things to pass out at our booth. Oh, of course we do. Of course we do. Uh, as a matter of fact, there might be Lord and Art's seriously mysterious slide puzzles like this one. Oh, I knew it. Dag That's for you. Yeah, that's I for you guys. I have been searching for hours for something cool to outdo you this year. <laughs> and I'm about <laughs> sick of you. <laughs> <laughs> you always have the coolest pens, which, by the way, I found where you got them after Ooh, plenty uh -oh. of searching I did, uh -oh. but you just outdid it. I give up. <laughs> Slide puzzles. That's right. <laughs> um, okay. I think we got to get right to it, Danielle. It's yep. time for results from last episode, which was naked crimes. Mm -hmm. Danielle told the story of a man who went on a naked crime spree starting at medieval times, and he ended in a shark pool at a local aquarium, complete with amazing back flop, yep. as she described it. Mm -hmm. And I told the story of a tense armed standoff that had an unexpected visitor when a 28-year-old naked girl drove up in a golf cart. <laughs> Still not over it. <laughs> Obviously, I won. I'm just going to call it now. Obviously, John won. Uh, but I guess we should look at the numbers. Danielle, how did it play out? How did I win? All right. So, unfortunately. Yes. John, <laughs> what? I received 62% of the votes on the website <gasps> poll. Whoa, 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 what? The, uh, and you it, received did 38%. Did I not mention? She, she was naked on a golf cart? I know. She was naked on a golf cart, driving into an armed standoff. <laughs> Honestly, this may be like genuinely one of the first times that I am a little bit shocked. I for sure <laughs> thought you had that one in the back. Like I was beside myself over your story. <laughs> Well, I don't know. Medieval times. Yeah, it's hard to beat medieval times. That is, is like the pinnacle of entertainment. I so. know, especially my description. Fantastic. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and then on the Twitter poll, I received 58% of the votes and John 42%. It was close. I got to say, was. thank you. Yeah. Thank you to the people that voted. Uh, it was certainly close. And I don't think there's any issue with saying, uh, Danielle, my hat's off to you. Congratulations on a job well done. Uh, unfortunately, I'll be here all month. <laughs> so do I get the Red Bull can now? How does that? Oh, no. What? <laughs> well, I, I'm literally over here holding my mug because I just wanted everyone to know that I found it. <laughs> she did. The, I did. The mug has been found. I did. In my attic. No clue why. Strange mm -hmm. things happen at my house. So <laughs> Interesting. Well, today we are looking into ridiculous ransoms. Now, criminals have been cashing in on kidnappings and abductions for years, netting millions, and in a few cases, even a billion dollars in ransom money. The first ransom note in American history dates back all the way to 1874, according to smithsonianmag.com. In that case, two boys were abducted from their front lawn in a Philadelphia suburb. One boy was released, but his brother, Charlie Ross, was still missing, and three days later, a letter arrived. The letter was clear, although not written in great English, stating, you will have to pay us before you get him from us and pay us a big cent too. If you put the cops hunting for him, you is only defegan you own end. Okay, I have to quickly say, I don't even know what defegan could actually, what, I don't know I, what they're getting at. Have you figured it I, out? I don't know. Okay. Uh, maybe defeating your, I don't know. Yeah, no defegan. defegan. <laughs> I'm never getting over that one either. Now, five no. days later, a second ransom letter would come demanding $20,000, which is about $400,000 in today's currency. That's a lot of money. The mm -hmm. kidnapping would go on for months with 23 different letters coming from the ransom demanders. Police, who had never really dealt with a case like this before, kept working leads and had two men in their sights as the potential kidnappers. Unfortunately, 
the two men died in a botched robbery attempt in Long Island, but one of them, as he laid there dying, confessed that they did indeed kidnap Charlie Ross. Before he could say anything else, he passed away. A third man would be tried and convicted of complicity in the Charlie Ross abduction, serving seven years in a penitentiary. However, Charlie would never return home. Now, America's first ransom letters were found in 2012 by a school librarian who was going through old family artifacts in her basement. With no connection to the Ross family, they're not exactly sure how the letters wound up in a plastic bin filled with family memories. Yeah, it's definitely a little bit odd. The letters... Yeah, maybe they were looking for the crime after crime mug while they were down there. Yeah, they could have could been. Be. I'm telling you, stranger things have happened. The letters were put up for auction, expecting to fetch around three to $5,000, but in the end, there was a bidding war, and the winner paid $20,000, the same amount that was requested and the ransom demands. Today, Danielle and myself have gone hunting for the most ridiculous ransoms, and that can mean many things. The amount, the way it's carried out, or maybe even what was taken. Let's get it started with a case told by the amazing and talented Danielle Hallen. Woo, I love that introduction. Yeah. You speak with me so highly, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like, you know, ransoms are one way to play on our humanity. Yeah. I could not even put myself in a position I would be done for. Oh my gosh, it would be awful. The love that we have for others and how much we're willing to hand over to get that loved one back. <sighs> I mean, I can see why holding someone for ransom works. The psychology of it all pushes us to our most desperate limits. But what if the person being held for ransom isn't even alive anymore? Hmm. Interesting, right? Mm-hmm. Charlie. I think that's usually a component that needs oh, to geez. be part of it, right? You would assume <laughs> you would assume so, John. You yeah. would. You would. Now, Charlie Chaplin is a name we're all very familiar with. He was born on April 16th, 1889, and he went on to be a worldwide icon in the film industry, in particular for his screen persona, The Tramp. I feel like we can all see it now, the little walk. I can't get it out of my brain. Mm -hmm. I think he did a great job adding some comedy to silent film, which drags on in my opinion, but beside the point, <laughs> I'm just, I had to be honest, had to be honest. <laughs> But Danielle needs her talkies. <laughs> I know, I do. I need some words there. I just get bored too easily. Yeah. But behind the funny and entertaining Charlie Chaplin, his start to life was actually very far from easy. He grew up alongside his brother in Kennington, London, where his mother, Hannah, was barely able to keep any food on the table. With no financial support from their father, Charlie and his brother were bounced around from workhouse to workhouse to at least guarantee a roof over their head. By 1898, unfortunately, Hannah was admitted to a mental asylum, which forced Charlie and his brother into the care of their father that they barely knew. This too was a huge blow because he struggled really badly with alcoholism, but eventually his death and a visit from the Society of Cruelty to Children, the boys were placed back into the custody of their mother who was labeled as in remission, which I found very interesting that they would label someone struggling with mental health in remission yeah the whole yeah. story i don't, i went we all know how i feel about psychology i totally went down a rabbit hole with that one mm -hmm. but as i'm sure you can assume yet again she fell ill leaving charlie to roam the streets alone as his brother had since joined the navy and was long gone but during his difficult childhood he found comedy and acting as an escape by the age of five, he had started to perform on stage with his mother cheering him on in the background. She genuinely did want to see her son succeed in something that he loved. 1899 to 1900, he joined the Lancashire, I hope I pronounced that right, Lads Clog Dancing Group. They toured all over England, but still Charlie wanted more. So by the age of 13, he said, forget it, left school and joined a theatrical agency in London. And from there, his comedy and theatrical appearances became legend. Now, at the age of 54, Charlie went on to marry 18-year-old Una O'Neill, which we won't get into that. And over wait, the wait, 18... Wait, wait, <laughs> I tried to skip it. I did. I tried. She's trying to... Hold on, hold on. 54 <laughs> and she was 18? Did I, did I hear that right? Yeah, you sure did. Okay. All right. You it's go, something Charlie. else, but I know. You go, Charlie. Una, I've got some questions, but... Right. <laughs> Over the 18 years that they were together, they remained married, they had eight beautiful children, and after lots of legal troubles in the U.S., 
they finally settled in Switzerland on a beautiful 35-acre estate until his death on December 25th, 1977, at the ripe old age of 88 years old. Christmas Day, not really a good way to go out, but, you know, he had been struggling a lot with his health. He was 88 years old. I feel like, you know, lived a nice, long, good life. But Charlie, at this point, had long since denounced his fame. He was living a simple life in Switzerland. He wanted the funeral to be exactly the same. So on December 27th, a private Anglican ceremony was held, and he was buried in the, and I'm going to absolutely butcher this, (laughs) Corsier sur Vive. I I buy it. Sounds right. Sounds right to me. Sounds right to me. (laughs) Cemetery just above Lake Geneva. So it was a really calm, peaceful ceremony. Many other film icons shared their condolences and respect to a man that they said was, quote, a monument of cinema. You know, he did a lot of things a lot of people hadn't. And he Mm -hmm. ended up leaving his young wife and children over $100 million and was described as the most dramatic rags to riches story to have ever been seen. But. Dun, dun, dun. Uh Uh-oh. On the early morning of March 1st, just two months after Charlie's death, not two months. A little over. A little over. I got too technical in my brain. That's okay. Una and her children received an unexpected and alarming phone call from Swiss police. Apparently, his afterlife was going just as rough as his start to life had, which really kind of sucks. It's sad. It had been observed at the cemetery that Charlie was buried in that someone had come in during the night and dug him up out of his grave. Oh, oh my God. Nobody could fathom why on earth this would ever be done. But a phone call came in shortly after. Una was notified that, you know, the love of her life, the man that she had just buried. And this phone call filled in the question. Phone call stated that Charlie's body had been taken, and in order to ever get this body back, Charlie's family had to hand over six hundred thousand dollars. Whoa! In nineteen seventy-seven, seventy-eight. Yeah, that's a that's a hefty price tag. Yeah. I wonder yeah. if it had been released at that point. How much money had been given to his family? Right. I right. couldn't find the answer to that anywhere, but. I genuinely yeah. wonder, because that's a hefty price tag there. Well, and you know, I mean, he was so famous for so long, and he helped, uh, he actually helped start United Artists. Mm-hmm. Uh, he did a this ton is, in his lifetime, like a ton. Yeah. Like his own composing, mm-hmm. directing, like you knew that there was some money there. Um, yeah. So even if they didn't have the official record kind of go out through the press, I'm sure these guys were oh, at yeah. least aware. Yeah. Wow. So a massive investigation was started to try and figure out who on earth was behind this ransom and theft. Meanwhile, the world is yet again captivated by Charlie Chaplin. The -hmm. media began to speculate at different reasons as to why Charlie's body had been taken. Some believed that it was over a few very, very, very controversial films that he had directed. Others stated that he was Jewish but he had been buried in an Anglican cemetery. And this apparently started some big thing saying he's not even Jewish. I don't know. There were a whole bunch of different things going on in this time period, but no one could really come up with a reason that made any sense. Over 200 public telephones were tapped along with Una's phone in hopes that they could find the individuals responsible when they would call back, hopefully making more demands. Now, sure enough, they did call to see where their money was, and Una told them that they would never get their hands on the money. (laughs) She did. She was like, Charlie would think that this is ridiculous. Yeah. She was like, he would laugh at you. After all, it's not like you can kill him again. Like, what are you going to do if I don't pay up? No offense. I'm sure she loved her husband, didn't want his remains out there. But like, what leverage are you working with here? Yeah. Yeah. Not well thought out. I mean, and he was a comedy, you know, really deep into comedy. And he kind of dabbled in a lot of dark things. So he would have laughed at this. Now, infuriated and realizing how idiotic their plan was, the perpetrators decided to set their sights on Charlie and Una's eight children, and they started to threaten to kill them if the money wasn't paid. So it's very clear they realized quickly, "Mm, this isn't working. This isn't working very well. But still, Una and the police did not budge. Una surprised me. I mean, she straight up was like, you're ridiculous. Yeah. No, you won't. (laughs) Yeah. So instead, they hoped to lure in these perpetrators by faking ransom deliveries. Now, unfortunately, none of these went well. 
in one instance, a policeman dressed up as a chauffeur bringing the ransom, but it all fell apart when a local postman fell suspicious of the chauffeur that was actually a policeman and followed him and then report him reported him to police. So Wow. And you know what's interesting? I saw that they actually arrested the postman for foiling their plans. Oh, really? I don't know how on earth they did it. I tried to look deeper into it to see what exactly they thought they would charge him with or if it was successful. Yeah. I think they were just very angry. Yeah, we charge you with being a good Samaritan. Like what? I know. This postman was like, something's <laughs> not right here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm dealing with this real quick. You want people like that in the community. Uh, I'm just saying. Seriously. Yeah. So after five weeks of back and forth demands, there were pranksters attempting to take claim of the crime. Swiss police had had enough. They decided to put a man physically on every single public phone in the area. So when the time came, they could immediately jump into action. They were sick and tired of chasing these men, and it worked. Swiss police ended up arresting, and I'm absolutely also going to butcher these names, but <laughs> Goncho Ganev from Bulgaria and Roman Wardis from Poland. They were two mechanics that no one knew. Together, these men led police to a farm only a mile away from the chaplain home where they had reburied Charlie in order to hide him. Charlie's body was immediately taken and reburied in the original plot, but in order to prevent anyone else from taking his remains, he was put into a concrete tomb. Like, they encased yeah. this man. They're like, you're not doing this again. Yeah. Ganev and Wardis, on the other hand, were taken straight to trial, where their idea behind this absolutely ridiculous ransom came to light. So both men were apparently political refugees. They had fled their home country. They were trying to find better work. And when their efforts proved fruitless, Wardis and Ganev became desperate. So Wardis came up with the idea of stealing Chaplin's remains, believing that right away the ransom would be handed over, all that money would be handed over, the family could lay him back to rest, and obviously they would have money to make it through this very difficult time. The town that Charlie lived in was very small, so his life and death, like we've already spoken about, and his wealth were very well known to everyone in the area. So this seemed like a great opportunity. Wardis ended up telling the court that they went and dug up Charlie's coffin and that it, quote, didn't make them particularly squeamish. Wow. Oh, like, are you bragging about yeah. that? What, oh, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> geez. And they placed the coffin in the backseat of Ganev's car for transport. Now, from there, they took the coffin to a nearby cornfield where they planned to rebury Charlie. Now, I have actually seen, and I couldn't quite figure out what necessarily they were talking about. I know they either originally had a plan to actually just bury him deeper underneath where he was supposed to be buried. <laughs> but I've heard that rain came in and it just, the ground was too hard to move. And so they okay. took him somewhere else to softer ground and then buried him or they were saying that they were trying to bury him way deeper where they hit him and i could not for the life of me figure out which one okay but okay, something gotcha. happened ruined you know all their plan to bury him deep to hide him more yeah hmm. but after this job was done wardis decided to call the chaplain family under a fake name making demands that turned into threats when this plan didn't go accordingly Wardis explained that he came up with this idea after he saw a similar heist and ransom used in Italy. However, other than copying this idea, he very clearly did not put any more thought into it at all. Right. So the court ended up deeming him the mastermind behind this entire horribly laid out plot. He was sentenced to four and a half years of hard labor to pay for his crimes. Now, Ganev, on the other hand, was clearly asked just to participate and then blindly followed along with the scheme based on everything that he stated. He did admit that he transported the body in his car from the original burial site to the hiding spot. He also said that he wasn't at all bothered by lifting and moving the coffin because in his words, death is not important where he comes from. <laughs> okay. I find it Maybe so- Maybe there's something lost in translation there. There I has to be. <laughs> there, I was like, both of them, to go out of their way to make it a point that they weren't bothered by what they did, just blows my mind. Um, yeah, yeah. But he also claimed that he didn't even know extortion was the plan behind it all. However, I think that's a load of BS. Why else would you have agreed to it or done it? You know, you can't tell me you had no clue. Yeah. He even actually went as far as saying that he was shocked that the public was as upset as they were. 
Yeah, he genuinely believed that they were just committing this petty crime and no one would care about it. And he could not believe that the public went crazy. Well, I mean, it, the the crime in itself already terrible. Yeah. But then the way that they escalated it and start threatening the other family members far worse. Uh huh. You know, because there's there's one thing to be said about like, okay, they had their big funeral, mm -hmm. they got to say goodbye, um, and yeah, would it suck for them to not be able to go back to that spot and yep. know that that his remains were there? Mm -hmm. Yes, but you could still go to that spot and know that that's where the funeral was and that's where yeah. you last saw him. Like, I, I get it. On the emotional tip, it's, it's going to be tough to deal with the fact that he's missing. But look at what they did. Like, what mm -hmm. else are you going to do with remains like that? You're going to wind up just, you know, moving them somewhere else and they're yep. going to sit there. So, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't get this whole thing about, uh, oh, I didn't even care. We were handling the coffin. I didn't, did, didn't bother me at all. It's so strange. I mean, that yeah. should, I don't even know how their minds went there. But then again. Well, then get a job at the cemetery. Exactly. If, you're if so this good. doesn't bother you, then I have a great yeah. place that you can go to work. Because yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's something yeah. you'll deal with every day. Yeah. Ultimate, and I also, I'm yeah. kind of, I'm kind of weird on the whole, like they're treating one guy like the brains of the operation and then treating the other guy like the muscle angle. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what? They work together. Who cares who came up with the plan? Exactly. It doesn't matter. And then you... <sighs> To me, it's so wild that they just accepted that he had no idea that extortion was the plan, like that he had no clue a ransom was going to happen. Yeah. Then what did he ever say what he thought he was going to gain from this? He didn't just do this yeah. for fun. Like there had to have been something there. Like I don't I'm not falling for it at all. I think he played dumb and unfortunately it worked out in his favor because they ended yeah. up only giving him an 18 month sentence. See, that is that it. Just, yeah, that doesn't make sense. I mean, if one guy gets four years, they, they should have both got four years. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I will say both of the men and their families did go on to write letters to Una apologizing. Okay. Ganev, they actually labeled Wardus as the nicer guy in all the articles that I read about this. Wow. <laughs> Saying that he felt sorry. So Ganev just was, I think, on another planet for all of this. But either way, they did all right. Their wives even wrote to Una saying, you know, we're so sorry about this. And she did say it was all forgiven. She's like, you know what? It is what it is. We'll let bygones be bygones. You know, it's done. Interestingly, the farmer of the cornfield was infuriated. <laughs> he was. He was pissed. <laughs> So these guys dug up my corn. <laughs> yes. Well, so it wasn't even just that. So when it took, you know, weeks for them to finally arrest these guys, finally be taken out to the location, we're talking, this is now going into like spring, you know, early summer. Yeah. <sighs> Everything had overgrown. They had no clue where they put him. None. Oh, like they wow. thought they did. They went out there, no idea. So they had to like, tear up a lot yeah in order to yeah. actually find charlie's remains so, i didn't think about that the recovery yeah. effort is what ruined it okay yeah gotcha. so all of his crops at least a good portion of them absolutely screwed um but he did eventually say you know what it is what it is and he actually put a plaque out there <laughs> where his remains were found a little plaque that you know said charlie briefly came to rest here which I thought, oh. I thought it was kind of nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So on top of that, decades later, a film called The Price of Fame was released. And it was a comedy loosely based on the theft of Charlie's remains. Uh, I guess if you're going to do it, like, I, I kind of, I want to think about uh, Una's perspective on that. Exactly. You know, like, what would she think mm -hmm. that Charlie, like, how would he respond to something like that? Um, they did initially get upset they were not okay. very pleased they weren't sure you know how it was going to go because it wasn't very factual it just very loosely was based on everything but sure you know in the long run the family actually said you know what this is exactly what charlie would do with this story he would have taken this exact story and done the exact same thing so some of the family members even decided to play parts in the film to pay respect okay. to him um and so it ended up being it ended up being a good thing. I think they did realize in the end of it, you know, Charlie would have thought this was hilarious. The yeah. family has, however, stated that in a way they almost wish they never found him. <laughs> they wish they had just dropped it. They were like, you know, this field was beautiful. 
<laughs> they did. Yeah. They were like, this cornfield was beautiful. It so fit Charlie, you know, his wish for peace, his wish for anonymity after all of those years being buried yeah. in the middle of this cornfield would have been perfect. So honestly, despite this absolutely ridiculous ransom, I feel like I almost feel like it was like Charlie's way of coming back and doing something crazy, you know, and out mm -hmm. there, which is what he did his entire life. And I don't know. It's just a very interesting, quirky little story. And it did not work out well for these guys. I don't know what they were thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like they were just caught up in the fantasy of, of Absolutely. the money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was just driving actions that <laughs> don't make a lot of sense. No, not at all. Huge thank you to burialsandbeyond.com, Vintage News, Independent.com, The Guardian for all of the information on this story. Yeah. Yeah. Little uh, little piece of trivia for you, Danielle. Don't do this to me. Yeah, a little piece of trivia. No, no I'm, I'm just going to give you the answer. I'm not going to ask good. you. Good, perfect. It's not a trivia question. This makes me anxious. <laughs> I'm not good at trivia. <laughs> uh, longest standing ovation mm. at the Academy Awards ever mm -hmm. was for Charlie Chaplin. That doesn't surprise me. They gave him an honorary Academy Award years after and basically you know for a while people thought he was a communist yeah uh, it was fbi rough. yeah fbi was like uh mm -hmm. looking into him that's why he uh, fled away to switzerland exactly and he he caught word that he was going to do a tour for one of his movies promoting his movie yeah and he was told hey if you leave the country they're not going to let you back in mm -hmm. so he decided to move his family yep. Um, then it was, I think it was decades later. I'm pretty sure where, it was about 20 plus years. He had not come back. Yeah. And then finally it was kind of America's homecoming, mm -hmm. you know, letting him come back to accept that award. 12 minute standing ovation. Wow. Really interesting story, Danielle. I um, mean, this man, even his life after death is absolutely crazy. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you couldn't write that kind of thing. No. Um... All right, so uh, I, I see I've got I've got a little work to do here, but I want to get that cut back. I'm holding uh, it for ransom. I'm sorry, you can't have it. I need mm. at least a year's worth of wins. <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think we'll just stick with the competition, and I'm gonna try to win it back. <laughs> but uh, when we get on the other side of the commercial break here, uh, Danielle, I'm I'm pulling out all stops. Uh -oh. Not only. Am I talking about a ransom? There might even be an, ele an element of it that ties back to our very first episode. <gasps> this is the remember? end all be all. I'm going down. Do you remember what the first episode was? I do remember what the first episode was. Hmm. What was it? Wasabi. Yeah. Wacky weapons. That's I right. Know. That's right. Hmm. How's it going to tie? You're going to throw me into retirement. <laughs> I can feel it now. <laughs> We're going to find out right <laughs> after this commercial break. If you don't give me what I want, you'll never see your HelloFresh box again. But I can just order another one using the HelloFresh app on my phone. Oh, I guess you don't want this tasty one-pot Mexicali black bean soup. I cooked it in less than 30 minutes and barely have any dishes to do, and it's so good. <laughs> John, you can have that box. I'm going to order another one, and I'll be customizing my order right now using HelloFresh's newest feature, Hello Custom. I can swap out one protein for another, swap out a side dish, add a protein to an amazing veggie meal. I... I didn't get to customize this box because I stole it from your porch. Well, I warned you, John. You could have gotten free HelloFresh by going to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime16 and using code CrimeAfterCrime16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Wait, that sounds a lot easier than flying out to North Carolina, waiting in the bushes all night, and being attacked by your 40 animals. All I had to do was go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime16 and use code CrimeAfterCrime16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Crime never pays, John. Try America's number one meal kit right now. Welcome back, everybody. Mm-hmm. I don't understand how you pulled this off. What? Connecting this off? to our very first episode. 
Oh, it's special, Danielle. It took a lot of work, but uh, you know, I don't shy away from that. I jumped right in and uh, got, got busy. You ready? I'm ready. All right. On top of all that, Danielle, I gave myself a special challenge, but I'm not going to tell you what that challenge was until we get to the end of the story. Okay. So My I even threw it on, going. on top of like, hey, I know I got to get a good story. I'm like, ah, I got this idea about a type of story. Okay. All right. That's how you found it. Sneaky. Mm. I was wondering how you found all these great search terms. Mm -hmm. Telling you, you got tricks all up right. your sleeve. I do. Connecticut, 2018. On April 6th, a couple contacted the police asking for help. The woman received a terrifying message from her 21-year-old nephew. They played the message for the officer. The nephew said he had been kidnapped and the abductor was threatening to burn him. There would be several phone calls. In one, he asked, TT, I was wondering if you were going to send that money because I really want to go home. The abductor wasn't asking for a million dollars or even a hundred thousand. How much do you think he wanted, Daniel? It's going to be something absolutely ridiculous. It's going to be like $500 or it's not even going to be money. It's going to be like a hello fresh You're... box. I don't know. It's going to be something weird. <laughs> you got some good instincts. 800 bucks. Are you serious? 800 bucks. I mean, at least go with a thousand at that point. <laughs> I mean, yeah, where does that come? Like, are you short for rent that month or something? <laughs> no, like, like, that's like a very specific yeah. I need 800 bucks, but I don't want a penny more. No, just that. Uh, yeah. Well, the local police contacted the FBI. They began working to trace the phone calls. They soon found out that it was a cell cellular phone. Um, they also told the aunt to ask her nephew to have the abductor text a photo of the nephew to her. She told him, I want to make sure you're still good. Uh, she also relayed that they were working on getting the $800 ransom together so you know kind of the usual thing mm -hmm. hey we got to get the cash together yeah. but you know daniel i mean we're talking 800 bucks isn't that a trip through the atm or mm -hmm. <laughs> i don't know so the photograph that they asked to be texted mm -hmm. came and this already ridiculous ransom story takes another big turn the nephew was lying face down in a blue plastic tub with a three foot alligator on top of him Danielle, this book, this this man's life was threatened. <laughs> the alligator's mouth open as if he was about to snap at the camera. No wonder he was scared and wanted to come home. He forgot yeah. to mention, you know, kind of an important part. I was thinking that too. I was like, why is the first thing you're mentioning is the burn thing when you've got a an alligator? You're in a tub with an alligator. <laughs> I'd be way more concerned about that imminent threat. I, I would think so. <laughs> um, quote. The photo was clearly meant to intimidate the family into giving up the money, said Bridgeport Police Captain Brian Fitzgerald. In case you were wondering, Danielle, alligators don't survive in the natural habitats of Connecticut. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. That was my next question is where on earth did this person get an alligator? <laughs> yeah, winters, a little too cold up there. Yeah. You actually won't find them much further north than Danielle's farm in North Carolina. Oh, I can't talk about it. I'll have nightmares. <laughs> and on top of that, it's actually against the law to have an alligator as a pet in Connecticut. In another phone call, the nephew told his aunt, Titi, they got this alligator on me and they're saying that if no money is given, they're going to have him chewing on me. <laughs> I'm not trying to die right now. <laughs> I wouldn't be trying to die either. <laughs> Wait, but so like not only do they have an alligator, but they can command this alligator. I guess. Like, don't He's chew on him now. You wait. Chew. Yeah. I... <laughs> Leave it. Leave it. I just, I love the phrasing of, I'm not trying to die right now. Like, maybe it's just my age, but that's, that's just not how you would say that. No, it's you know? not at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm not trying to die right now. <laughs> so just to sum up to this point, we've got a kidnapped nephew, mm -hmm. $800 ransom being held at Alligator Point yep. in a giant, and it was described as this. A giant Tupperware container. Okay. What else can we throw into this story? Oh, How about no. some Chinese food? Oh. Chinese food, Danielle? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? This already sounds like a Coen Brothers movie. Oh, my the, gosh. 
phone tracing efforts catch a very lucky break. They noticed that the same number had called a Chinese food restaurant that same day in nearby Stratford called Great Wall. Detectives called the restaurant and they found out it was a delivery order and they still had the address. They still had the information. <laughs> it was delivered to a hotel room at a residence in, in Shelton. Bridgeport Police Captain Brian Fitzgerald said this about the call for Chinese food from the same phone. Yeah, not the brightest. No, not at all. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, police now know exactly where to go. Bridgeport and Shelton police descended on the hotel room, but they didn't find the nephew. They entered the room and found a woman and the alligator. I was about to say, please tell me the alligator is there. Yeah, with a big lump in his belly. No. no. Oh, no. It's just the Chinese uh, food. Yeah. The alligator was taken by the State Department of Environmental Protection and detectives interviewed the woman. She was the girlfriend of a man named Isaiah Garcia. Now, Isaiah is a convicted felon out of Garland, Texas, where he served time for robbery. The girlfriend's info kind of fits the weird, wacky tone of the rest of the story. She said that Garcia showed up at the hotel room with the victim tied up. He ordered the victim to lie on the sofa. And then Garcia just sat there staring at him until the kidnapped nephew fell asleep. Hmm. And then at that point, that's when he ordered the Chinese food. I guess, yeah, I don't know when the Chinese food came into play. Uh, she also said that Garcia was supposed to be returning soon. So police set up in the parking lot and waited. Garcia's pool, uh, Garcia's pool, Garcia's car pulled mm -hmm. into the hotel parking lot with the abducted nephew sitting in the passenger seat. Cops converged on the car with their guns drawn. Garcia was pulled out of the car. They found a large hunting knife in his pants. The nephew was helped out of the car and they could see that he had two burn marks, one on his face and one on his right forearm. He said that Garcia, you ready for another wacky weapon? I'm ready for it. Garcia used a barbecue grill lighter to burn him when he was tied up. You know what I'm talking about? Those like candle. Yes. Like long, the very long ones. Yeah. With the little tiny flame at the end. <laughs> <laughs> like the tiny little click. I guess if you turn them up, you can get a decent flame at the end. But mine always have a little ridiculous tiny no, flame. No, you like can't end. even light your grill with it. Right. <laughs> and it go. it's like always out of fluid somehow. Yeah. Yeah. That one. Bridgeport Police Lieutenant Christopher LeMain said, It is an outrageous case, but it is clear from the evidence that this young man's life was in danger. This was no joke. Garcia was charged with first-degree kidnapping, attempted first-degree larceny by extortion, unlawful restraint, third-degree assault, and threatening. He was held on $345,000 bail. At his first court date, he initially pleaded not guilty, and he asked for a jury trial. According to investigators, Garcia said that he and the nephew got into an argument at a local condo complex. Garcia said that the nephew was scamming him, so he hogtied the nephew and put him in the giant Tupperware container with, with his pet the, alligator. With the alligator. He then drove the container to the residence inn, stared at his kidnapping victim until he fell asleep, ordered some Chinese <laughs> food, and apparently went on a joyride with his victim at some point. I don't know why they went driving anywhere. I, I have no idea what that was about. I don't know about you, Danielle. I think you're catching on to it. Some of this story feels a little off. Mm -hmm. And the court proceedings kind of point to that as well, though we don't get like a super clear explanation. Yeah. But in January of 2019, Garcia would wind up pleading guilty to reduced charges, like severely reduced oh charges. Oh my gosh, yeah. Judge Devlin would say it was not a clear cut case. Public defender Jonathan Demergian would say our investigation developed information that contradicted the original statement of facts. So I don't know. I just had this feeling that like maybe the nephew wasn't exactly an unwilling participant. It's just too bizarre. It's really weird, and isn't like, it? And like it was the, I think it was the car ride that really threw me off. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. The comments kind of like the first thing you noted about the initial comment, not yeah. talking about the alligator, about he's threatening to burn me. Yeah. And then ultimately when they do find him, yeah, he's burned, but he's been burned by a barbecue grill like, I mean that's not 
I mean, it would suck, but it's not like life threatening. Yeah. And then like know. $800 is the amount. 800 is the amount. Like even that kind of, well, I'll talk about that as we get here. But um, yeah, like the amount seems like someone just thought, hey, I wonder how much we could ask for that would get paid easily. And yeah. maybe we wouldn't have like real serious criminal charges. Yeah, you like know? someone was desperate, like you said, like to pay their rent or, you know, something. And they're thinking, what can we pull off? Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, in the state of Connecticut, there are actually six degrees of larceny. The most serious is the first degree. And that is for amounts of over $10,000, mm -hmm. um, which is weird because they did have, they were trying to file first degree larceny charges. And I don't know why if the yeah, ransom was only eight hundred. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. But yeah, yeah that's kind of strange. Uh, eight hundred would actually fall into being a fourth degree larceny charge, which isn't even a felony. It's yeah. a class A misdemeanor. Um, and of all those charges initially filed, according to the press um, articles from around January of 2019, everything was dropped except for one count of first degree unlawful restraint. So that still sounds like. Yeah, like nephew, at, like, I don't know. I'm getting the feeling that they had kind of hatched a scheme together. Yeah, that's what it kind of feels like. And then as they were playing it out, maybe things went a little too far. Hey, un, you know, let me out of this tub. Nah, I'm going to let you sit in there for a while. Something, I don't <laughs> yeah. know. Sorry, I can't get my alligator to move. <laughs> yeah, well, and then it gets even weirder because even so outside of the press mm -hmm. i went looking at the actual um online court records and jail records that i could find around this case uh the records that i reviewed made it look like there was also an additional charge of second degree strangulation or suffocation related to this case and once again i'm just thinking that might be tied to putting the yeah. victim in the plastic bin yeah you know that'd be the only thing i could think of yeah uh it looks like garcia was also found guilty on that charge and he was sentenced to 30 months plus three years of probation. Uh, he had already served time waiting for the trial and all that. Yeah. So uh, with that, he's scheduled to be released no later than December of this year. The nephew or his family never publicly identified. Uh, it was reported that both the nephew and the alligator are safe and being taken care of. And um, I don't know, considering that strangulation suffocation charge. Yeah. I just, I, I'm conflicted about thinking, was the nephew a willing participant or not? Yeah. And if he really was, then you would think that there would be charges filed against him. And I think his name would have probably come out in the news at some point. That's what I that. would think so as well. Oh, yeah. that's so and bizarre. It never did. I need to know more now. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a really weird one. Um, my gut is just saying there's a chance that maybe these guys hatched a plan together and then yeah. it went too far in some way or, or took a bad turn. Um, but honestly, I don't think we'll ever know for sure. And on top of that, uh, no charges seem to be filed against the girlfriend as well. And how freaking bizarre. Seriously. Like, doesn't it? It sounds like a Coen Brothers movie, like just this it weird just heist ends. with these bizarre <laughs> characters for $800 <laughs> that, that winds up costing the guy that's going for it years in jail. Like, it's just, it's Good so grief. out there. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. All right. Yeah. All right. So. Thank you, Connecticut Post, New York Post, News 12, Connecticut, Newsweek, the Cummings Law Firm, the State of Connecticut Judicial Branch, the Connecticut State Department of Correction, and Wikipedia for information contributing to today's story. What was my special challenge with today's story, Daniel? That's what I'm like sitting here waiting. It was the smallest ransom I could find. Oh, that's a good one. And it's a hard search. Like, I, go ahead and try it. You will find Look, nothing. Look, I could barely find anything just in a broad search with this. Yeah, yeah. That's it was the already, smallest yeah. real something that I can consider a real ransom that, that I could find. Good grief. Well, you know what? No, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out how on earth he got an alligator. <laughs> well he's from texas just so you know hop in the back seat have... bud we're going on yeah. a drive <laughs> yeah get in the plastic bin and uh we're going to connecticut <laughs> i'll I so quickly call out people for that but i also have like a full-on petting zoo at my house right right <laughs> i'm so quick to judge i need to be careful <laughs> well i was kind of yeah and i was interested it seems like you don't want alligators around you have a no, thing about alligators i do so he actually used to have this like recurring nightmare 
that alligators could somehow get into pools, like through oh, okay. the drains. Uh, I don't okay. know. It was like a childhood thing. And I would spend my summers at the beach at this condo. And I always went to the pool with my friends and you could not get me in the eight foot like deep end. Never. I swore an alligator was coming through that drain. Okay. It's horrifying. Okay. And North Carolina is kind of like a weird place where, yes, maybe there's some here. You know, you hear stories about it. Um, yeah. The beach that I frequent, I think a couple of years back, a huge one just like walked across the road. And so I try to pretend they're just not there. <laughs> I'm serious because I haven't seen them. Well, I go kayaking all the time and like the marsh areas all around, like the sound of the beach I go to. And that's usually where you'll find them. Mm hmm. I can't. I cannot. If I saw one, you would never catch me at the beach again. And we already know how I feel about that. The oh, beach yeah. is you like that. my place, you know? You need the beach. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> no. Okay? I can't do it. Well, after my research on this, you know how Google like messes up your, mm -hmm. your results on everything. So YouTube is now showing me videos of alligators. Absolutely. And one of them, yeah, one of them was this guy was like friendliest alligator in the world um bops bops my cheek and like i saw a little footage of there's his face as he's in this kind of swamp water and this alligator like right here like bopping <laughs> no giving him a little bop a little bop out on of the my cheek. skin oh. <laughs> oh my goodness like you won't even catch me like all the places in florida where you or like even in myrtle beach south carolina like you can like go on this little walk thing yeah like yeah. a bridge over alligators and stuff? Absolutely not. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard about that. Yeah. Ooh. yeah. Can't do it. Well, what do you think? What do you think, Danielle? That was a what good you one. About, you like that one? That was a really good one. I like that that tied into so many absolutely bizarre things. I feel like of everything I was expecting from a ransom video, neither of our stories were it. Yeah, I do expect. <laughs> yeah, I feel like, like that all. too. Well, and honestly, like we know the big stories, yeah. like the Patty Hearst, yep. the Lindbergh baby. Like we weren't going to go that way with mm -hmm. it. Um, but I was really interested when I started <laughs> unpacking this story and I was like, mm -hmm. wait, what? Did I read that right? And then just another few sentences later, wait, what? I know. <laughs> I know. And it's those kinds of stories where you start like Googling. You're like, is this mm -hmm. is this like a real thing that happened? I or... know. <laughs> yeah. No, is this it's possibly all something that's made up? <laughs> I found the prison record. I found the charges. Yeah. Good grief. <laughs> Well, as always, we have some extra stories, because why not? We're going to keep the fun going for a little bit here, and we're starting with Danielle. All right, you guys, June 2021. All right, Butternut Squash Cafe. I can't even say that with, like, a serious... <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of that. The Butternut, Butternut Squash, Squash Cafe. Squash Cafe in Edinburgh, okay. Scotland, realized okay. something awful one day when they opened up. They were okay. missing their beloved garden gnome. Their garden gnome was their missing. garden gnome, and where their gnome once sat was none other than a ransom note. Now, this ransom note was not demanding money, nothing like that. But instead, the kidnapper demanded two cheesecakes be set outside when the cafe closed for the night. I kid you not. But butternut squash cafe held strong. They refused to bow down to the demands. So instead. They set up two pieces of shortbread. Now, well, that's going to teach him. Oh, it's so going to teach them. <laughs> it infuriated whoever took this garden gnome. They sent angry notes saying, I did not ask for shortbread. I asked for cheesecake. It's all right, though. Butternut Squash Cafe just replaced their garden gnome and moved on. Wow. That's wow. It. They weren't going to cave in. They weren't. They that weren't caving it. into that. They are not handing over yeah. two delicious cheesecakes to someone willing to steal a precious garden gnome. Well, Danielle, I, I thought I was looking for the lowest amount for a ransom, but you might have just beat it. Although, I don't know. Two maybe the cheesecakes, cheesecakes are expensive. They are they must, $400 each? I don't each? know, but they must be real good. <laughs> I guess so. Wow. Well, that kind of ties into mine. Mine is also from the United Kingdom. Mm-hmm. In 1977, I like saying that like I'm an old man. In, in 1977. 1977, in the UK, a new snack came on the scene. Potato chips or crisps, as they're called over there, called Monster Munch. And they featured three flavors, 
See if these sound good to you, Danielle. Okay. Pickled pickled onion, saucy, mm -hmm. and roast beef. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will say I love pickled onions. Okay. All I right. do. I don't know yep. if I'd like them in chip form. Mm hmm. Well, and like what kind of like what kind of sauce are we talking about here? <laughs> uh, apparently, saucy isn't made anymore. I, I found uh, online people talking about, wow, I really wish I could go back in time just to try saucy because like they don't know what it is. Yeah, yeah. I would imagine Very maybe vague. like barbecue. That's like what barbecue I would sauce. think. Like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, during the '80s, they ran commercials with three cute furry monster costumes, okay. and the the monsters couldn't get enough of these crisps. You know, that's what the commercials were. These mm -hmm. monsters are just eating these things. I would like uh, to know when uh, they got Liam's permission to be a part of this. <laughs> My son Liam is actually, <laughs> yeah, he's mm -hmm. a chip monster. He is. He's a chip monster. Um, so a new company takes over in 1995 and then the fuzzy monsters thing kind of goes away. Mm -hmm. Then in October of 2008, the company decides, Hey, we're going to relaunch the brand and we want to use those same old costumes from back in the eighties. So they search their warehouses and they can't find the costumes. They put out a public request and a few months pass. No one contacts them, but then a letter shows up right around Christmas time. It states, quote, meet my demands and the monsters won't get hurt. The writer was asking for 5,000 pounds and to prove that they were serious, they included three pieces of fluff that were <gasps> hacked off the monster costumes. Oh. I mean business. <laughs> the ransom demand would continue with two additional letters being sent, but rather than pay the demand, the company hired a private investigator. You're joking right now. I'm not. This is all <laughs> legit. Despite the senior brand manager making the statement, quote, we are desperate to track down our three furry brand icons. Um, they would never find them. Oh, they no. did. They also put a website together called findourmonsters.com, but the costumes were never recovered. According to a Reddit post, only one of the costumes, roast beef, has been recreated. That was done by a company. I don't know if they wound up using it in the commercial or not, but Ugh, of all of them, so all all three monsters still missing, and someone trying to get five thousand pounds sterling, proving that they have it by hacking off some of the fluff and sending it in. And you know, like we were talking about, that's going to be uncovered one day by someone, and they're going to be like, <laughs> "Yeah, oh yeah." Well, but what? Now keep this in mind. <laughs> They were asking for $5,000 for three costumes. In my story, a nephew's mm -hmm. were only worth 800 bucks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's it. <laughs> Famous costumes, 5,000, 5,000 pounds. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Danielle, you're up. All right, now this one is honestly awful, which probably you know explains why you cannot find any names involved in this case anywhere. But okay. according to the Orlando Sentinel, a woman and her ex-boyfriend got into a pretty heated argument. In a flurry of anger, the ex-boyfriend ended up, one, stabbing this girl with his set of keys. But two, to get back at her, he snatched the woman's urn filled with her grandfather's ashes. He took the urn and he ran off. Now he got back in contact with this woman and he said, you are not getting your grandfather's ashes back until you pay me $40. Oh, you did it again. Another low ransom, 40 bucks. $40. <laughs> and another like rant, like not 50. Well, it's and the you, same you thing as like the 800, like not a thousand. Like I don't right. get this. But you've also attacked someone with keys. You've also stabbed like, somebody with a set of keys. Yeah. $40. Now, okay. ultimately, she ended up handing over this $40 to get her grandfather's urn back. However, police were there to aid her. They ended up arresting this guy, and he did go to jail on battery Good. charges. Yes. Yes. Good. Like, of all but, things. Like, it's... And it's, like, the same yeah. as my main story. Like, really? Right. <laughs> Right. You're joking right now. And yeah. it included a weird weapon. I'm circling back here. Uh oh. She's I'm coming circling after back it. and I didn't even know it. <laughs> it's like my brain could tell. <laughs> She's fighting for that mug, ladies and gentlemen. I am. 
I'm fighting for it. <laughs> okay. Well, I've got one more turn to take here. And I'm going to Florida, too. I'm going to the oh, well. Oh, boy. I'm telling you, you have to. Marathon, Florida, 2010. Stephen Lacasio went to his secret stash, a wooded lot, to find his six large marijuana plants missing. Mm. And a note was left in their place. Thanks for the grow. You want them back? Call for the price. Stephen called the number and haggled with the pot plant kidnappers to get the ransom down to $200. The plants were likely worth about a thousand each, so this seemed like a decent deal. They agreed to meet up somewhere. Stephen handed over the 200 bucks, and that's when he learned he was being arrested. Oh no. The, ran <laughs> the ransom note was left by cops. <laughs> You know they had so much fun with that. <laughs> yes, they did. I'll haggle you. Let's, yeah. let's, let's go back and forth here. The police had no way to trace the plants back to their owner when they found the grow. So they left that note just kind of half joking. But literally 10 minutes later, their phone was ringing. <laughs> He's like, wait a minute. You've taken something of mine and I need it back. And soon Stephen was in jail. CBS News reports that upon searching his apartment, they found 20 more plants, four pounds of freshly harvested marijuana, more drugs, and over $1,300 in cash, which they suspect was proceeds from drug sales. Man, that's like an unlucky situation right there. Oh, seriously, seriously, Stephen. And if, I mean, he, he had all that marijuana at home. Like, dude, let the six plants go. Yeah, like, it'll be all right. <laughs> it'll be all right. Haggled him and everything. Good grief. Yeah. How about that? The police pulling off a ransom. I'm kind of impressed with it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all right, you guys. Who is going to win this month? You guys get to vote. Who had the best ridiculous ransom story? This is going to play out real interesting. I think so, too. I, I feel like we were slugging it out there in, we in the end. We're going to see. We're going to see how this goes. <laughs> you can vote for the first seven days after the episode drops over at our Twitter account, at CrimeAfterPod, or... You can also head over to www.CrimeAfterCrimePodcast.com and you can vote there. We also always have a link in the description box below. You can also click the little letter I up in the corner of the screen and vote there as well. At CrimeAfterCrimePodcast.com, you can find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to suggest show topics, join our Patreon, or shop our Teespring store. And speaking of Patreon, a huge thank you to our patrons. I absolutely love it over there. You guys get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly. I do an update on all shenanigans happening on my farm. We talk <laughs> about all sorts of crazy things. You get to learn a lot about John and I and see just kind of like a fun side of us. So it's a fun place to be. Plus, you get a personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special when you join. So absolutely good Come deal back there yeah come back next month for our next episode crimes done for fame Ooh, i feel like this could be one of my favorite topics so i'm like really holding on to the hope that i can find a good one. Oh, i think you can hopefully People we find two good ones dumb stuff for this i think so too like really dumb stuff especially m modern you know <laughs> social media day like yeah we're gonna see some interesting stuff i think yep this show is produced and hosted by myself, Daniel Hallen, and the one and only John Lorden. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. And the best way you can help others find us is to tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone that you love crime after crime, and they need to check it out. Thank you guys for hanging out with this episode, and happy St. Patrick's Day. Have a good one. Have some green beer. We'll see ya. 